because we learn more. <laughs> and all of us learned to have an English dictionary with us. <laughs> this is kind of what happens when you paint over old paintings. done, I think everything's okay until about 10 years later and all the underpainting comes through. So I learned to use that to my advantage. Okay, I think each one has a different speed, a different size, a different shape, a different movement. That's what you go for in collage, not necessarily your paint. What? At uh, <clears throat> the next to the last one, did it become a bit more lyrical because of the uh, kind of the breakdown of two different backgrounds there? Yes. Because it, it, it changes everything. Yeah. But now that's like music. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and, you know, watch this one. I'm going to do something funny here. Here we go. From the very eyes. We can change the idea of the painting every time we change the color or the dominance of the color to something else. The side, the shape of the of the uh, of the uh, the L you, you're putting in there, and what, whether it's an L or something else. No, no, no. You have to go take a look at it. Okay. What the, what determines the shape? Nothing. Nothing. Okay. You just you just arbitrarily. I arbitrarily do it. Okay. I arbitrarily do it because I'm not painting anything. Okay. I am searching. So. I'm a big believer in the subconscious. If you work long enough and you get tired enough, your subconscious goes into work and you find things. Collaging for me is not making something that you really want to put in the metropolitan. You're making a collage to discover things cheaply that you're not going to find by scribbling on your canvas. You don't want to go to your canvas and make your canvas the discovery. You want to find the discovery either through yourself by regurgitating your life, because that's what you're painting from. And collage is a way of doing that. Like if you notice, I automatically work in a curve. Automatic. That's my nature. That's what I do. That'll change at some point. Other people will work in angles. Hell yeah, I've done drawings. I've taken some of my collages, I do sketches. And then they give me an idea to begin an inspiration. In other words, like when I was doing uh, Hildegard, I was searching, how am I going to do this? I, I'm not going to go running around looking for notes and color. So what is my effect? So I started doing collaging, and the musical sense came out of the collage, because the music was in my head. So. Because, you know, she was a 12th tone. She was in the 12th century. Music is fun fundamentally the best I've ever heard, man. Whew. But that's what makes you make these subtle changes, you know? And in that, in that process, often you trip upon an idea. The collage has helped you to eliminate too many complications in the original idea. That's what collage does. You take away. Theoretically. Show you what I mean here. We'll put a black on top of here eventually. 
eventually, but just for the hell of it, let's do this. Yeah, it's coming, you know, that's what I'm trying to get you guys to be free. You're not trying to make a perfect collage, not at the beginning. Eventually you will. But its real purpose is for you to have a very inexpensive way to discover things. And, and to slow down about making art. Everybody's in such a damn hurry to make art. We got art coming out of our gizgos, you know. <laughs> What you want to discover is what you want to see. How do I see? How do I feel? How do I evolve? What's going to separate me from the, the 20th century? How am I going to move without becoming a robot? That, that's where you are. That's the important thing. And collage allows you to do that if you free it up. Now, a lot of times, I'll have a still life, and then I'll do the collage with pieces of that to show you can use concrete ideas to evolve. That's what I do anyway. But these are two totally different approaches experimentally. And those experiments will enhance you the rest of your life. Now, I don't usually do them that big. I had a notebook about like this. I used to do them all the time as a student. I gave one to my monitor in 1998. She did a whole bunch of paintings and had a show in <laughs> Japan. <laughs> it's pretty good, actually. I was real happy for it. <laughs> but that's because I want you guys to be free I find, I find when I walk around a class I pay attention to everybody I don't always speak to you because you're not ready but I do pay attention because I want you to grow the whole purpose to be in a class is not to find an easy chair it is to grow and evolve. And if you can't evolve in this school, you can't evolve anywhere. <laughs> of course, if you're stubborn as you are, you ain't going to go anywhere. <laughs> but a lot of you guys think I don't notice, but I notice everything you do. Mm -hmm. shift back. <coughs> and even though the other one was interesting, it's not as interesting as that, theoretically. By layering and bearing and evolving, you have a different concept. Now, 
Unfortunately for me, I'm a painter of inspiration. I can't paint without it. If I'm not inspired, I do a lot of color theory. Or I write a lot of bad poems. Just to irritate people. I do like Tony Reday. So that's what you do. But I don't wait at home for inspiration to happen. I look for it. I search for it. And when you find it, you get another 20, 30 paint. But I'm not any good. Like I had this uh, work for the telephone company. And the guy come in and he said, oh, you're, you're a painter. I said, not yet. And uh, I was just a snot kid. I didn't even know there was canvas in those days. I was painting on sheetrock. You know. So he said, I want you to do a painting of my three brothers. There's the three monkeys. <laughs> and I said, the guy next door does that. I don't do that. Said, you got to know who you are. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but you meet them all. God bless them. <laughs> okay, here we go. That's what I was looking for. negative space to speak on its own. Oh, I know it. I actually have something interesting. I don't know how the hell that happened. It's actually done. I'll hit you with a hand. Okay, now this one. It's like a guy with goggles on. Okay, so this one will do the opposite. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. I don't really know what's going to happen. We have no idea what's going to happen. That's the beauty of it. Change the idea, change the painting, redesign the time. So when you're collaging, if you like something, make sure you get a drawing of it or a shot of it. Because when you push it to its limit, you get all kinds of stuff. Okay, here we go. One thing I forgot, my razor.
out too that when you work in secondary colors, some of them are weak, some of them are strong. And their strength and weakness kind of always comes about with what you put around. activity on one corner. Everybody gets one. So there you have, without formula, without process, sheer reaction from eye to eye to colors that I would normally use. What happened? What happened with, with the larger area to the smaller areas? Why are the smaller areas more active than the bigger areas? What is the position of the large areas to the relationship of the volumes in the rest of the painting? That's what you're searching for. In that process, sometimes you end up with a painting. It happens. You, know? you get a hundred muckies, you, you get Shakespeare. Yeah. But see what I was doing? I was not letting one piece float. You always make a unit that they kind of fall into place with each other. If you're collaging, especially on your painting, and you just stick something up, you're not paying attention to the weight that you put up there and how it's, what it's doing to the paint around it. So if you throw up, up an element up, you have to figure out what is that doing to the top and the bottom and the middle of the painting. This idea that because you're abstracting, that you don't have to organize is an idea that came out of the madness of the 1930s and 40s. The clarity that some of those painters found, a lot of people seem to ignore. For example, everybody wants to make big deal about the circles, the squares of color, and all that stuff, but they're not paying attention to Franz Klein who created real strength, power, emotional, a sense of time. And he did it by relating to a world. 
And his world was trains, construction, buildings. And he used that to develop his sense of power. And he got there purely by accident. He turned one of his drawings upside down and found out it was more interesting upside down than it was the way he drew it. And he blew it up on his wall and cut slack. So what they got into in, in an abstract sensibility, they got further and further away from lyrical and got deeper and deeper into the unknown. The subconscious, the evolution of their own self. But they never gave up. Klein, de Kooning, and Gorky never gave up the bridge that makes great art hold together over time. And there's very few that can hold candle to those guys. Leslie, Hardigan, people like that. Mitchell, when you turn her paintings upside down. The school that has been represented at the Metropolitan now is a very good show, not for its aesthetic sensibility, but for you to understand how the creative mind traveled through ideas and evolutions and tried to move away from one concept into another. And you can see the camps dividing. There was the camp of the Kandinsky School, which I never understood, and the camp of the school that said abstraction is, is when you begin to distort reality and have it force, force upon it your own personality. You're developing your own sensibility. In other words, you're creating a new reality. That's why people can't understand it. They've never seen it. So you have to learn to be very alone a lot. <laughs> That's what abstraction is being driven to. And the ones that want to stay at throwing paint, God bless them. They'll probably make a lot of money, they'll end up in the Whitney. But they will not make civilization grow. The creators that evolve under a strong foundation are the beginnings of humanity, which we're vastly losing day by day. So I have a lot of tremendous credit and passion for all of you because you evolved. But you don't take my word for anything. Go look at a good client. Go look at uh, someone who throws paint and tell me what holds your interest more than 30 minutes. The hardest painter for me to understand and evolve was Rothko because he gave up so much and thought he was on the right track by focusing on the own color. But it didn't work. The thing that was positive about it, he gave us a lot of information. What color can do, how it can create a sense of mystery, how it can create a, a, a voyage. You can sit in front of his paintings and take a voyage. That he gave us. But when you add the very elements, the bridge work that Hoffman taught Vitlachil, Vitlachil taught me, and about 9,000 other people, was how to make a viewer who doesn't know you from Adam Find your pulse. Hear your voice. And that's through structure. And it doesn't matter if you're building a car, a house, or a painting. They all have to have that inner, inner strength in order to survive. Collage, in this fashion, is just one of the many ways. You can do it in a notebook like this, quick. Of course, you've got to be careful they'll stick together here. So you, you can do a lot with this. You can do a lot more than I did. I got limited by my equipment. <laughs> so any more questions? You can call it a day. Come get a piece. Thank you.